Hi everyone, Salams, um, and welcome to the first MFest event of the day, Archiving for Ourselves. I'm Raheel Mohammed. I'm the founder and director of Maslaha, which is the charity that is running uh, MFest uh, with our partners, the British Library. So MFest is a multi-arts uh, festival. It's a festival of Muslim knowledge and creativity. And we've been so fortunate to bring together so many amazing artists and thinkers and organizations and collectives to celebrate the diverse collective power of diverse Muslim communities. And we're connecting back to our roots and celebrating our ancestral knowledge, but we're also importantly imagining thriving futures. I'm just gonna run through some housekeeping now before the event. Um, so please use the menu above to leave any feedback that always helps with future event planning. You can also donate to the British Library there if you wish. Social media links for our speakers are below the video in case you want to carry on the conversation on other platforms. You can also leave questions in the box under the screen. And welcome and thank you again, Samaya, who's been doing so much of our BSL interpreting over the course of MFest. So I'm really excited to introduce this event, Archiving for Ourselves. It's so relevant right now. And um, chairing the panel will be Latifa Akai. Mm -hmm. So Latifa is Director of Education at Maslaha and a trustee at the UK-based Inclusive Mosque Initiative. Latifa has a background in law and formerly worked as a journalist in Istanbul. Her poems and prose have been featured in a range of places, including The Good Journal, Poetry Birmingham Literary Journal, and VS Poetry Podcast. Thanks so much and enjoy the event. Thank you for that introduction, Rahul, and welcome to our audiences and to our incredible panel, who I'm really excited to introduce. Um, so I'm going to just go straight into introductions to our panelists because we've got a lot to get through um, and I want to make the most of this time. Um, so with us here today, we have, first of all, Anchal Malhotra. Welcome, Anchal. Um, Anchal is joining us from New Delhi. <clears throat> Anchal Malhotra is an oral historian and writer. She is the co-founder of the Museum of Material Memory, which is a digital repository tracing family histories and social ethnography through heirlooms, collectibles, and antiques from the Indian subcontinent. Malhotra writes extensively on the 1947 partition and its related topics. Her first book, Remnants of Partition, was shortlisted for no less than five awards, including Sahitya Akademi Yuva Paraskar, British Academy's Nayef Al Rodan Prize for, cult for Global Cultural Understanding, <clears throat> Hindu Lit for Life Nonfiction Prize, and the Shakti Bhatt First Book Prize. Her second book on the generational impact of partition in the language of remembering comes out this autumn. So, welcome, Lanchal. <clears throat> and my voice is going already. Um, next up, we have Asma Jama. Um, hi Asma. Asma is a Danish-born Somali artist, poet and co-founder of Dakan Collective, a feminist art collective based in Bristol. As part of Camel Meat and Tapes, Dakan co-creates with elders and young people in the Somali community, exploring orality, memory and archiving. As a poet, Asma has been published in places like Amvit, A-N-M-L-Y and The Good Journal and has been translated into French, Swahili, Somali, Spanish, and Portuguese. This year, Asman was shortlisted for the Brunel African Poetry Prize and longlisted long for the National Poetry Competition. Most recently, Asma was commissioned by BBC New Creatives. We're so happy to have you with us, Asma. Um, next up then, we have Ghazal Hakani. Ghazal is a textile artist and a parenting facilitator working closely with communities in Newham. Um, Ghazal has been a journalist with Al Jazeera and is passionate about poetry and people power. Ghazal calls Newham her home and has lived there for 12 years. She is a co-producer of Maslaha's audio documentary that we're launching today, A Merciless Light, COVID-19 in Newham, alongside with myself and Emily Mason from the Maslaha team. Um, and we'll be hearing more from that in a bit. And finally, we have Sadia Ahmed. 
Sadia established the amazing Everyday Muslim Heritage and Archive Initiative in response to the lack of representation of the Muslim narrative in archives, museums and education in Britain. There are three archive collections consisting of oral history interviews, personal documents, photographs, um, held at five archive depositories across London and the Southeast. Alongside her experience of fundraising, project planning and managing heritage projects, Sadia has also negotiated collaborations and partnerships with museums, archives, academics, universities, artists, media and community groups across Britain. So welcome to all of you um, and thank you so much for making the time for this conversation. Um, so we're going to hear from our panelists in just a little bit, but first of all, you'll have seen on the event information that we're launching today an audio documentary, A Merciless Light, COVID-19 in Newham, that we produced at Maslaha over the past year. Um, so just quickly, why did we produce this documentary? So last year, as the pandemic took hold, um, I think for a lot of us, there was that realisation and a real dissonance of knowing that the heartbreak and the terror of the reality of how the pandemic was being experienced for the most marginalised communities um, was not being reflected back in the news, in official reviews, and in fact was being actively written out. I think this year in the UK and across the world, we've seen government and media gaslighting of a really extreme degree, and that can feel yeah, can feel so, can make people feel so powerless. Um, and in the UK, we had, um, for example, a Public Health England report last year that was supposed to examine the disproportionate effect that COVID has been ha having on people from ethnic minority groups. And um, that review was then widely condemned by black and brown organizations and communities for failing to actually provide any recommendations um, and commitment to action to actually address any of the social factors and factors contributing to that disproportionality. So given that failure of formal reviews to involve the voices of the hardest hit and to accurately account for experiences, we decided to run a community-led research um, project into how COVID-19 was being experienced by black and brown working class communities in the London borough of Newham. Early on in the pandemic, it was revealed that Newham which has the most ethnically diverse population of any borough in the country, was the hardest hit borough in the UK at that time. Um, we've worked in Newham for a long time at Maslaha, and so we decided, along with Ghazal, um, who we'll be hearing from today, who's a Newham resident and who we are blessed to have worked with for some time at Maslaha, to produce an audio archive of experiences of stories that were otherwise not being sufficiently recorded or heard. We wanted to create an archive of evidence to speak back to official reports and reviews, and importantly, to preserve the truth of what people were experiencing. Um, Saidia Hartman, whose incredible work teaches us so much about working with archives, um, has said, fact is simply fiction endorsed with state power to maintain a fidelity to a certain set of archival limits. Are we going to be consigned forever to set to tell the same kinds of stories? Given the violence and power that has engendered this limit, why should I be faithful to that limit? Why should I respect that? So please make yourself comfortable. And um, the audio documentary lasts for 25 minutes. And um, please take time to listen and to sit with the incredible and very generous testimonies on this documentary and to share that with others. Um, and then we'll get into, we'll, we'll after this get into our conversation. So this is A Merciless Light, COVID-19 in Newham. Writing that piece on Newham being the worst affected area in May was a bit of a whirlwind because the ONS data came out at 10 a.m. and I started digging through it and I saw immediately that Newham had the worst COVID-19 death rate. Within an hour of that data coming out, I was door knocking in that death cluster, doing that as safely as possible, of course, you know, I had gloves and a mask and I would knock on the door and then walk back out to the pavement. So I'd be doing the interviews with people on their doorstep, but me on the pedestrian pavement. If we take our minds back to March, 
this virus is being called the equal leveller and people would say something like, you know, this virus doesn't discriminate. Um, and that's the tone that people were taking at the beginning of the pandemic. And I just thought it was so important to show that's not the case. Like, yes, the virus itself doesn't discriminate, but it moves and travels in a community that does. My name's Amna Modin, I'm a news reporter at The Guardian and I live in Newham. And this was the first place that me and my family lived together when we came to the UK as asylum seekers. We were kind of separated for a little while as a result of the Somali civil war and I saw my dad again for the first time in like so many years and where I kind of really considered my life, like the life that I have now beginning. I feel huge hometown pride that I'd never thought I'd feel as someone who was a child refugee. The very concept of home and where I belong is going to be a lifelong issue for me. I just don't have that in Newham. <laughs> just because it fulfills and satisfies everything that I want. I love that Newham is one of the most ethnically diverse places in England and Wales. I love that our Christmas panto is, you know, a black girl with braids. She gets to be uh, Rapunzel. I love that you walk and you feel like you're in the middle of the city, but then if you cycle five minutes further east and you get to Wanstead Flats and you can walk up to Epping Forest, it's some of the most beautiful green spaces in London. There's nowhere else that I would rather have been brought up, to be honest. Like, I love it. I I just feel blessed. And I think, as well, as a black woman, like, growing up somewhere in Newham, within the UK, was such a blessing, you know? To go to a school with kids from many different backgrounds was a blessing. 72 languages were spoken by the kids at that school, you know? That's amazing, like we have so much to be proud of. I think when I think Newham, I think survival, you know, and I think resilience because people are resilient in Newham because they've had to have been. Also, the kids here do very, very well against all odds. How are you living in overcrowded housing, which is in really bad condition, and then you're going to school and getting AIDS? How is that possible when it's because of we're all trying to raise each other up in a lot of ways? That's how I felt, especially when I was growing up here. It's hard. I'm not romanticising it, but it's a hard place. But where you've got a pressure cooker, you're going to get diamonds in it. There's this Audrey Lord essay that has this thing about a merciless light, you know, it just feels like COVID has shone a merciless light on these inequalities that have been there and have been exacerbated, I would say, in the last 10 years, since the crash and the Tories came to power. And I think Newham's never been a wealthy borough, but I think it's had a lot of wealth in terms of community wealth. Whereas growing up, there was a lot of poverty. Right now, it feels as though like it's more claustrophobic in that the poverty is still there, but you're right next to something which is much more high end, much more luxury. There's a very strong community, one that's based on resistance in Newham. I think people have been really strong to challenge the frustrations they've had at the way gentrification has played over the last decade. Whenever I speak to friends from school, the vast majority can't afford to buy a house in the area. Probably can't really afford private rents either, can just about manage if you have a decent enough job and the majority of your wages goes to rent or if you have a housing benefit, then you can probably rent privately. Again, we know that the private rented sector is like mad in so many different ways. So that's our main outlet for living in the area. And then there's the third option, council housing, which, again, isn't happening for a lot of people. To get a council house is like winning the lottery. So what options does that give everyone that I know from school, including myself? So my name's Asif. I'm a medical student, raised, grew up in Newham, from Maryland, living in Forest Gate. 
I don't think it's a big ask to want to live in the area you grew up in. No one's asking for like a mansion or proper luxury living. It's just, we'd like to live in the area where we grew up, where our parents are. We wanted to focus on Newham as the first branch of the union because of how messed up the housing crisis is, specifically in this borough. And one of the factors that we considered is that about 40% of people in Newham are renting privately. Back in 1991, only 7% of people rented privately. And it just shows how much of our social housing has been privatised over that time. And that's many more people in insecure housing that we need to fight for. My name is Amina Gachinga. I am a Newham resident and an organiser with London Renters' Union. London Renters' Union is a members-led union of renters across London. And we have a branch here in Newham, so we're called the Newham and Latest Own Branch. And the purpose of the union is to challenge the injustice of the housing crisis and the housing system and how it is rigged in the favour of landlords, investors, and how it doesn't work for the majority of people, especially working class people, especially black and brown people. I think especially with like rents rising and cost of everything in the area rising, much more than our wages have risen has meant like we feel much more strangled in terms of what we can and can't do. So much of your money just leaves your account straight away at the end of the month, the second it comes in. Let's not forget that before the pandemic, people are already struggling to pay their rent. On average, a new renter will pay between 60-70% of their wages towards rent which is just an extraordinary figure. The type of housing you live in, how you live, affects your health hugely. And when it comes to community, again, where you live, whether or not you can live in your area affects everything. For like kids and stuff, school, if you're moved to like temporary accommodation in Harlow, which is like proper far away, or like Hayes or somewhere that's completely out of London, that's gonna affect how you perform as a child in education. I had a friend that moved his family got moved to like an area that was like two hours away from school. And these were like kids, his younger siblings were like five, six, going to school like on a two hour bus, coming back two hours again. That's gonna affect their grades, isn't it? So many of the things that intersect and like bind all of our struggles together is housing specifically in this specific day and age, isn't it? Because of where we're living, how we're living, what we're living under. If we look at temporary accommodation, for example, in Newham, that really exemplifies what I'm talking about as the housing crisis, because you have 14,500 people in temporary accommodation in Newham alone, and in the whole of Manchester, it's 3,000. So during lockdown, what I've seen and what we've seen as a union is that more and more renters are falling into debt because either they've been furloughed and therefore their wages have been cut by 20% or they haven't been covered by furlough. We have a lot of people who have no recourse to public funds in this borough. So if you don't have any recourse to public funds, you therefore can't get any support from the government. So this means that many people are falling into poverty. And what that means for their housing situation is that they're in very precarious situation with their landlord, who often is trying to harass them out of their home. As we've seen I think we've had three people who have been illegally evicted in our branch during this time, which has been very distressing and traumatising for those people. And we have a lot of people that don't know what their rights are and think that a landlord can just ask them to leave and then they will have to go. And so it's been really a crisis point for many families who don't know what the future holds for them. And obviously that creates a lot of emotional distress a lot of uncertainty and a feeling of being failed, you know, or not mattering. My name is Yeshu and I set up DOST Centre for Young Refugees and Migrants in 2000 in Newham. I'm now an activist academic my research is with young people with no papers, irregular immigration status, and I have a very long relationship with Newham. I was born and brought up here and I have lived most of my life here, 
Now, I remember when I started Lost, it was when we started in about the late 90s, early 2000s, and at the time we thought, oh, it's really hard, for, you know, for people that arrive and migrants or claiming asylum or particularly young people that arrived on their own. I mean, at least those kind of very basics were in place, you know, like there was a kind of acknowledgement that people were people and children were children. But I just think the deliberate kind of hostile environment has really shifted things. I think even before COVID and the lockdown, some of the services that I have been a part of and have had to access through childhood and life were already on the brinks of being overstretched. Just an example of London Black Women's Project, which is a service that I access as a young woman and without which I don't know where I would have been today. They were my only support network growing up when I was being referred to pupils referral unit or when I was in trouble with the police because I was a young carer and therefore no one was able to pick up that this is a child with difficulties. My name is Asma Gol and I have lived in Newham all my life and I am an independent children's occupational therapist. But it was again because of services like London Black Women's Project, I am the product of their support and their hard work, which now means that I'm able to be the person that I am in the community. So it makes sense to invest in these services that are doing the specialist work that know these communities, that understand and rather than demonise them, support these communities and families and individuals into more healthy ways of being in life, in a sensitive way, in a gentle way, in a generous way, rather than there is something wrong with you. I had to leave home. I went into care for a year and I had to go into a refuge because there was no space in care. What would have happened to me? I would have probably ended up going to one of the gang members' houses or slept in the graveyard like my sister did. If we look at our prison systems or if we look at the care systems, the young people or the children that are in there are black and people of colour. And so I think having those services is vital, is crucial, it's a lifeline that needs to be invested in, valued and acknowledged for their existence because without which you're going to continuously have a society that is distorted and broken. This ONS data was very data driven, just said these numbers and I wanted to show up who exactly is dying, which community is being specifically impacted and I'm really glad that I did because again it just kind of showed this virus was completely tearing apart the Asian and black community in Newham as well as the ethnic minorities, like the white working class were being quite significantly impacted, those who were on frontline jobs were being significantly impacted and I think that was one of the first pieces that really moved away from this idea that everyone's having a same pandemic. You know, there were people who didn't know anyone who had a case. There were people who, their biggest thing was about not being able to find flour to make bread. And it just felt like there was these two very different worlds happening at the same time. And the turnaround for that story was really, really tight. It came out at 10am, I had to file by 3 or 4. So it was just like going out there, doing as much door knocking as possible, getting a photographer down, seeing who would be up for photos, and then rushing back home to put that all together into a piece that kind of made sense. The response I had to it, I was really taken back. I think it got over like a million hits within 24 hours. It really kind of resonated deeply. But I spoke about this have and have nots. That exists in Newham. You know, there were people in Newham who were utterly stunned that this is what people were going through. The fact that this high death rate was happening in their borough was really shocking to them. Having worked in school for the last 10 or so years, I've noticed that families have just really hit rock bottom in terms of finance. And we've got families that are struggling. During the pandemic, we were giving out food parcels. And it's quite heartbreaking to go and see the children we see that are quite happy at school and to see some of the conditions they live in, overcrowded, lack of money, no food in some situations. It's quite heartbreaking for me. The no recourse to public funds is something that impacts us every day. 
and you see that families are hungry. We're giving away clothing, we're giving away uniform, and these are just basic things. My name's Julian Hilaire. I'm a learning mentor at Sandringham Primary School in Forest Gate in London. I was born in Newham over 40 years ago. I've worked and lived in Newham for the last 25 years. I'm proud to be from Newham, as is my family. My mum and dad came to Newham in the 1950s from the Caribbean. We're at a time where we've been asked in the summer to conduct Zoom classes of online teaching, and not every child's got access to a computer. Not every child has got Wi-Fi in their home. And I do think those in power and those above maybe just take it for granted that, wait, hey, everybody must have Wi-Fi. Everybody's got a laptop, haven't they? You know, they don't need state-of-the-art equipment. They just need equipment that's going to work. I think they do need to know if we want children to go back to school and to study well, we need to provide for them food, basics. And if they're going to be at home at any stage, we need to help the parents with the technology to make sure they get, while they're out of school, that education and that help. The government, they did not handle it well at all, especially with A-level grades. There were loads of people that were predicted A-stars, A's, and then they were, ended and up they were like, like B's and C's. It was worse if you're from like a bad background in terms especially of like the area, yeah, yeah, like Newham and like the area you live in because they based it on previous grades. But then it's weird because it's this rhetoric that they always say like, oh, no matter where you're from, you can build up and yeah. be great and be successful. But then when it comes to a situation like this, they throw that out of the window and it's suddenly, oh, well, your area's notoriously done worse. So you do worse. And that's not the case because there's so many people from schools like the ones that we go to, that go to Oxford, go to Cambridge, yeah. go to like Ivy League schools in the States. My name is Shah I'm in year 12 and I've grown up in Newham my whole life. My name is Ayat, I'm in year 12, I'm 16 and I've also spent the majority of my life in Newham. People that know that there's a pandemic outside, there's people wearing masks, but the mask isn't going to 100% protect you, but they need to go to work to feed their family because they're not going to be able to get benefits to support themselves or benefits to support themselves completely and they're not getting the grants and the businesses that they need to support their families financially they need to go out to support themselves because they either die from corona or they die because they don't have the money to live. I think people who aren't in these situations are like naive, like you see like white middle class uni boys partying in the pandemic with all their friends, like groups of 50, 60. And then when outbreaks do happen, it's all pinned on us. Mm -hmm. Oh, it's because there's like 10 people in one house, but you can't do anything about that. Mm -hmm. and Are we supposed to buy another house? Most definitely. If people had the ability to buy the other house, they would. I feel yeah. like that's something that for some reason goes over people's heads. It's just like, like it's, nobody wants to live in the overcrowded house. Nobody wants to go to work if they're mm -hmm. unsafe. I found those conversations to be really bizarre when people were trying to look specifically for biological factors as to why Asian black communities were having significantly much more higher COVID rate. If you go back to certain countries in Africa, like Kenya did extremely well in dealing with COVID-19. The virus spread rapidly, but people weren't dying to that same impact. And I think these are social issues, right? The reason why these communities are dying at far greater extent is housing, is because they have jobs in which they didn't have the opportunity to self-isolate or it's jobs where it's very forward-facing roles. They are the brunt of the service economy. They keep the country moving. And I think the conversation we were having on PPE, limiting that to the NHS was a huge detriment to the Black and Asian community in Newham because being a bus driver was one of the most high-risk roles you could have done during the pandemic. And bus drivers were picking people up from hospital, you know, and we've seen cases where they've gone on to die and after contracting coronavirus. And of course, like certain communities have much higher rates of diabetes or more likely maybe to be overweight. There are definitely conversations to be had but again those are social factors about who has the ability to exercise who has access to gyms who has access to parks and outside space who has access to decent food the impact of covid on the local area and kind of the, the main differences that didn't really surprise me. These are things that have been here pre-COVID and they're not recognised. COVID just made it more apparent how disproportionate and the huge health inequalities that we do have here, the poor outcomes. So COVID was just an additive factor, if you're asking me. It's nothing new that's happened for our area.
I'm Rehana. I'm a local GP working in Newham and I've been born and brought up here, so I'm very much Newham orientated. Having grown up here, I have a better understanding of the population and also I can understand their narratives and where they come from. These are people that have significant language barriers. They're not as digitally diverse as the rest of the population in the country. They can't easily access everything that's coming out on YouTube or on Twitter or whatever it is. There was a lot of stories going around amongst the kind of the older generations that if you end up in hospital, you will end up dying. So people were getting very sick and not going to hospital. And I've heard this through friends and families because they were kind of telling each other and messaging each other on WhatsApp, whatever you do, don't go into hospital because you will end up dying. The thing that everybody wants to talk about is people dying on their own uh, or people not being able to say goodbye or people having to say goodbye through iPads. I'm beginning to understand now when people talk about what a good death is, what that actually means and what dignity in death means and how the implications of infection control and all of the thing around the lack of PPE, how that has meant that so many people haven't had a good death. And then the other thing is about why, particularly in Newham, about why people didn't go to hospital and why vast parts of the community were not there and didn't get the support that they needed and the very complex morality around, is it better to die at home with your family or is it better to be in hospital and for attempts to be made to save your life? But that might be quite an unpleasant experience and you still might die at the end of it. I'm James, I'm an artist and a mental health activist. I work under the name of The Vacuum Cleaner. Exposure is a project of listening to health workers from Newham, capturing their stories, making portraits of those that exist forever, because they're going to be in the Welcomes Archive. The emergency department at Newham had one psychologist to look at staff wellbeing. No other department at Newham had any mental health support during the first wave. I have people coming to me and saying, I haven't spoken to anybody about what I've been through. There are stories that I am hearing about the effects on learning disabled people that are profoundly distressing. It's really hurting to hear that. And particularly, there's an intersection here between learning disabled people and people whose first language is not English. So the fact that translation services were moved online and what happens when communication needs to be in accessible ways and then translated into different languages, how that affects people. The pure rage I'm hearing from health workers about the fact that 111 is an English-only services. And I've now interviewed, I think, 28 health workers. 26 have said, I hated the clapping. A lot of them are saying, what I want is a pay rise. What I want is more nurses, more staff. What I want is a new hospital, a new that is fit for purpose. You can see the Olympic Stadium in lots of different bits of Newham or, you know, the whole really built up bit of Stratford. And that, for me, as I was rushing back home, became this huge sign of just how much the Olympic Games and gentrifying force had utterly failed that community. They were promised decent jobs, they were promised decent housing. They were told that money would flood in and it did, but it obviously didn't do so equally. And I think that's why I had so many people tweeting at me to be like, I can't believe this is a new I live in new This is terrifying. Not really realising what those in the much poorer bit of the borough were going through. We live in a very atomized society. We live in a very individualist, capitalist society, which brings about these feelings of shame. If you are working class, there's a feeling of shame of like, I have made it this way, or like, I'm not earning enough money and it's on me to do better. And there's a real lack of collectivist thinking. And that is one of the main hurdles that I see. And it's for me to encourage both myself and others to support people to step into their agency and to ask the right questions that are going to bring about this sense of like, 
I could do something about my situation and I could do something that would lead to an overall change. The community standing together on the face of a crisis that is trying to rip a community apart. For me, the fact that people can still stay strong despite the forces that are quite often more powerful than us, we're still here, is like a big thing. I'm just refusing to give up. It's not always all positive, is how I'm feeling. You can't be positive all the time, but it's a different thing to practice hope, is to say that actually we don't have a choice. My favourite place that I went to quite regularly and I still go to every morning, I go to meditate there, is Wonsted Flats, which is loads of loads of green space with small pockets of little forests where you can sit and listen to the birds, the parakeets. I even saw an owl there, which was, I felt like a sign from God and a magical moment where the owl just flew in on top of the branch. I looked up, it looked down on me, we stared at each other for 10 seconds and then it flew off to another branch and then another owl sat on that branch and then they flew off together. And I was just like, oh, praise be to God. I am watched and I am looked after and everything's gonna be okay. And that space was a real source of love wisdom, tranquility and peace in a very, very chaotic world. Thank you so much for staying with us and um, to listen to the documentary and um, it was a real privilege to co-produce it with my colleague Emily Mason and with Gazal who's here with us today and um, we ended with that beautiful it makes me feel like crying every time from um, Asma Ball who is incredible and a close friend and you should all check out her work and the work of everyone who is featured on the podcast and um, they you can find the podcast on the audio doc sorry on SoundCloud and you can see the list of everyone who was on it there um, so I first wanted to go to Gazal and Gazal I wanted to ask you um, so we we made that you know we, we decided to co-produce that audio documentary and I wanted to ask you what for you was that relationship in between recording stories and that kind of contemporary struggle um, so I felt that, you know, I, was, I felt really lucky and um, to be able to uh, participate in something like that and create this. Um, and so for me, uh, creating this documentary itself was, I felt, an act of activism uh, because it, it was, a, it allowed me to assert my truth. Because when it was, it was quite difficult to see how things were being reported on mainstream media. It was like as if the reporters were living in a different city or breathing different air, you know, as if this did not exist. So um, there were statistics, but they just were not able to connect the dots or the, the context was completely uh, missing. Uh, so it just made sense to be able to bring it all together and to uh, speak, to speak and talk back at those reports and those statistics to say that there is more, you know, we, we are here and uh, this is us. Um, so, yeah. Yeah. Thank you, Gazal. And I, I wanted then to open up that same question to the rest of the panellists. And I, I thought I would start with Anchal in terms of um, the relationship between your work in recording stories and then contemporary struggles. And when you first, when, when we were emailing, you said when you first listened to the audio documentary, you immediately thought about what was happening, what has been happening in India at the moment. Um, so yeah, I would we'd love to hear your thoughts. 
thank you. Uh, well, I guess so the first question for me is who is recording history and whether that recording is linked to forms of identity or nationalism or religion or in India caste and so forth. Uh, because more than often in the recording in itself, there's an inequality of voice as we've heard in the podcast as well. And when you sent me an initial invitation and the link to the podcast and I listened to it, I thought of last year when COVID hit India, the, during the first wave migrant workers left uh, the cities that they worked in because migrant workers work in big cities like Delhi or Bombay. And they went to their villages because they were fearful because they, didn't, they thought they may not get enough food from the government to eat, or they wanted to be closer to their family. So as a result, migrant workers, there was like an exodus of workers leaving cities and going to villages, and they were walking for days, or they were on buses and cycles, and they got to their village after weeks sometimes. And the most fascinating thing happened. They began recording their journeys on their cell phones, mostly uh, tagging the government on Facebook or Twitter asking for help. But it was the first instant of archiving for oneself, you know, where the, where the subject of the archive is, is speaking for themselves. And I thought that it was so monumental because it had never happened before. And people were paralleling that exodus to the partition exodus, which I write about, of course, but it was a different kind of exodus. What was incredible is that people that would ordinarily have been rendered invisible were now speaking and telling their stories. So I think that was the first thing that came to my mind when I listened to this audio documentary as well. Thank you so much, Anchal. Um, Sadia, I wondered what your, what your thoughts were in terms of that question of the relationship of recording stories and activism. Really, um, similar to what Anchal just mentioned, inequalities is what came up um, having been born and brought up in this country and then naively, I guess, realizing that our stories aren't, aren't valued as, uh, at the same level as everybody else's stories or native stories or not being part of British history when we've always thought of ourselves as British because you know we were born here, our parents have been here for like 40, 50 years and you don't, you don't, realize that your stories aren't part of that that narrative even though in school it's it's you know it's a very white British history um, and then the realization to think that there's that void there's an absence of our stories and where there is a representation it's very um, through a particular lens say um, and it's not our story it's not from our experiences um, and that that's really why sort of everyday Muslim came to be because it gave us an opportunity to say well okay you're you're not gonna you're not gonna acknowledge our stories but we're here and we're part of we're part of this country um, and, it, and I think what it does is gives us that platform and takes gives us that fundamental right of ownership of our own stories so there's nothing to stop us recording our stories. There's nothing to stop us sharing those stories. Um, and one thing that's really important is when we talk about archiving, um, archiving in the sense that it's going into a formal um, archival institution. So it's not just archiving that we've made a documentary or I've written a book because over time and, and from our work, we've realized that they get lost so we come across so many projects that have actually you know, existed before us and have, have um, documented and recorded stories and experiences and, and collected um, material, but they've been lost because they haven't actually been archived properly. So I think when we talk about archiving in this space, I think we really need to differentiate between archiving in the sense of making a documentary or a podcast or writing a book um, and formally archiving, which is the step which is probably the least accessible to our communities, but we really need to make it um, a priority in learning and how to, how to get there. And if we don't know, try to find out as, as best as possible, because I think that is the final step, which is actually what, what archiving should be about, because that's what, what the legacy will be. 
So I think in terms of, you know, how we're doing things, it's, um, you know, in, 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 st in stages. So yeah, write your stories, document them, um, but that's not archiving. Make sure that they're in an archival um, institute somewhere. Although I know that that's problematic in itself and we're gonna be talking about why later, but, you know, put it there for now. Thank you, Sadia. Um, and I'll pass on then to Asma. Hey, Asma. Um, and yeah, I guess to speak and feel free to also speak back to anything that any of the other panelists have just said. But yeah, I want, I'm really interested in hearing your thoughts on this. Yeah, I mean, you've all given such beautiful responses. So I'm just um, echoing. But I think, you know, with recording our stories, it is resisting a kind of erasure. And I think that's what the the documentary was doing. Um, but I also find it really interesting when it comes to recording things because um, of course, like, you know, the Muslim community, the black community are hyper surveyed. So yeah, it's really interesting when people actually have the agency to choose how their stories are recorded, um, whether they want their names to be included, whether they want their um, pictures. Yeah, and I think, you know, with our work um, with the Somali community, I think that's what we've uh, discovered as well is like uh, providing the space to choose how you're recorded and how you're remembered. Thank you Asma and could you just tell us briefly um, a little bit about um, what you do with Dakan and the Camel Meat and Tapes project? Yeah sure so um, for Camel Meat and Tapes we uh, explored the ways that the Somali community stayed in touch uh, during the civil war which was by sending cassette tapes to each other and we worked with um, elders and now we're working with young people. But um, yeah, we're really just looking at like the oral histories that have existed um, in our communities. Um, yeah, and also thinking about creative approaches uh, to, to understanding those histories. Thank you so much Asma. And I know we're going to come back to that again. Um, and I suppose I wanted to then move on and you've kind of bridged us into that, but to think about, um, the role of what the role of creativity is for all of you in in thinking through or or in recording and in archiving the past or interacting in any way with archives and histories um, and you know for us I think the process of producing that piece and um, that we listened to my colleague Emily described as a poetic archive and I think we were keen in in a sense it kind of also felt like a portrait in a way um, but we wanted, it was important to put it in a soundscape and we felt, you know, to weave, as, as a way to weave those stories together. And um, I suppose to, to do justice to them and to capture the momentousness of the details of those stories and reflections and, and elevate that in some way. Um, and I wanted to ask, you know, for all of you in, in your work, how that plays out. And I thought maybe, Anchal, I would start with you if that's okay. Sure. Uh, so the stories that I record are from the 1947 partition of India, which further broke into the independent nations of India and Pakistan, and then in 1971 into Bangladesh. And for the most part, these stories have been surrendered to silence. So the sheer act of exhuming something that is so distant, but also something that is still so traumatic is very delicate. I belong to the third generation of a partition affected family, all four of my grandparents' families were in what is now Pakistan. And one of the ways, which I think it's really unique in India and Pakistan because we are neighbors. And I speak specifically about India and Pakistan because there is quite a bit of contention there and it remains so. We are neighbors, we are siblings, we are twins, but we are also enemies. And this is the notion that we as children grow up with in both countries. So the creative struggle for me was how to do justice to each experience of each citizen involved in that partition. Can an archive be a tool to heal? And can you be respectful to someone who is supposed to be perceived as your enemy? Many times I found myself in Pakistan confronting questions about religion and identity and you understand that in creating an archive, you are also unlearning many things that you did not know you grew up with, the prejudice that you did not know you grew up with. So it's, it's also a question of broadening your own analysis of something. 
but for me the the biggest uh, struggle and also a creative endeavor was how to do justice to every story that i recorded whether it is a hindu muslim sikh christian parsi indian pakistani bangladeshi and i felt that the best way was to do it through material culture through objects they became equalizers in a way i would speak to partition witnesses about the things that they had carried across and these things didn't have to be big things and we will we'll talk a little bit more in the later questions i'll show some photographs as well but there were ordinary things like a set of coins or a notebook from their school or utensils or precious things like jewelry and when speaking about the thing everything else seemed to fade away and they talked about why they carried the thing and how the thing mattered to them and all these fortified notions of indian pakistani or what made you different didn't seem to matter so much because it was just about the event of partition and the event of migration and the event of being homeless and stateless that seemed to resonate you know the longing for land and i felt that it was something that did justice to the experience thank you so much ancha um and moving on then i we wanted to watch briefly um a bit of an incredible film that asma has produced um which is called before we disappear um it's an interactive piece that um the way asma has described it is it comes from our embodied experience of being watched seen observed and not being able to control that gaze um and asma i wonder just before we we watch it would you like to say anything or would you prefer to say it after um i think i think we should watch it yeah okay let's do that now then
Thank you so much, Asma. The film is so incredible, um, and I really recommend that everyone looks it up after this. Um, yeah, I just wanted to hear for you what that process, how the, what the process of leading to that piece of work was. Yeah, so um, the piece was initially actually inspired by conversations with my uh, relatives, because I asked them how they'd felt um, being in like uh, green spaces in the UK. And uh, one of them said that they once saw somebody coming and they hid behind a tree. Um, and I think I was really uh, struck by that idea of like wanting to almost fold yourself away and become invisible. And how, um, you know, of course we're like surveyed, but we don't, uh, it's not like you can choose when you become hyper visible to somebody and, and then a situation can become dangerous. So yeah, I, I started talking to the costume designer, Gulid Ahmed, and yeah, it was just like a process of collaboration. So they're based in um, Addis Ababa. Um, and we, yeah, we worked like remotely over like WhatsApp and Zoom. Um, and that's how we made the film. But yeah, I think I was just really interested in the idea of um, like this nation of people that had been uh, forgotten um, and that didn't think themselves worthy of being remembered. Um, so yeah, all of the viewers can like have the option of having having their voices added to this archive, um, but they can also have the option of having their voices deleted from that archive. So I think it's, yeah, I think it's really just like interrogating that space. And the music that we use is actually from um, the British Library, John Lowe collection. And I think there's something really haunting about um, like reanimating that um, and using it in this piece. Yeah, it's incredible. And what has the responses been um, from people who've shared on the archive, on the website? Yeah, I mean, I've, I've been, we've all been very like overwhelmed um, by them. I think it's really, touched people um, and one of the questions is like what are your protection spells and somebody said that they keep their grandmother's wedding ring in their pocket to protect them um, yeah so I think it's just yeah some really beautiful responses. That's incredible um, and I wondered Gazal do you have any kind of in response to that question that we're thinking about creativity and in hand in hand with archiving and stories. Did you have any reflections on Asma's film? And... Oh, you're muted, Kasa. So I, I think like lots of people, I found it very powerful, very moving, very unusual. Uh, and so it took me to spaces I did not anticipate, but really fascinating. And it sort of brings me a little bit to what I do in my uh, space, but again, it's uh, speaking about my history and what, so I'm an indigo dyer and um, I hold workshops and there are people when they attend it, I do speak to them about, um, about the history of indigo and how it is linked with the Indian freedom struggle. Um, and that can be quite an eye opener for lots of people. So it, it, it's like uh, they gently sort of nudged into a space where they have to, they're not only learning about how to use the medium, but also learning about the history and questioning uh, a little bit about what they already knew or how they would have seen it otherwise. So yeah, that's a little link there. Thank you, Gazal. And Sadia, do you have any reflections and kind of thoughts in response to that? Yeah, it was a lovely film, Asma. Thank you for sharing it. It was really powerful. Um, and I was gonna ask about the music as well because I thought the music really brought the film to life and it added like another layer of depth of understanding of what those emotions that person may be of going through. So I really like that. Um, I think creativity for archives is hugely important when we want to engage our own community, because what we find is that the archive, as in the formal archive, is really accessible to academics and researchers, and they find it really useful and they can go in there and find what they want. But when it comes to engaging our community with it, 
it's really important for them to to feel heard and and um, to be to feel visible within that space and have their stories um, valued um, and to be understood as being valued in a historical sense. So um, creativity really runs parallel within all the projects that we do. So it's it can be something like creating educational resources for classrooms. So we were able to bring our history into the classroom. So it's not a separate history, it's something that's part of British history and it's learned there. Um, we've also created like exhibitions, um, digital booklets, um, and, and a heritage trail, which is actually a physical trail, which um, goes out into to physical spaces and connects physical spaces together. So it becomes more of a wider um, connection to history. Um, and I think that's really important once we want to engage our own communities and make them feel part of history and part of archiving and, and giving them a sense of value in their stories. So yeah, for, for us as well, creativity is like parallel to all the work that we do. Thank you so much, Sadia. Um, and I feel like we're gonna keep coming back to some of these themes as we talk. Um, I suppose the next thing that we were, you know, we were considering in all of this really is, you know, oral history, as all of you know well, in the past has been seen typically as less objective than more traditional written sources um, because of its reliance on memory. It's somehow seen as more subjective than other archival sources. Um, so yeah, I was wondering what what would you all say to that? Um, and what possibilities do you think that working with audio and oral storytelling or archiving has that maybe other mediums don't? So, sorry, um, Anchal, if I start with you. <laughs> sure. Um, actually, this is one of the most important questions that I get asked because all of my work is on memory. And uh, often, you know, uh, my process, which is all of our process, really oral history is known as history from beneath. And it isn't given the same uh, respect in academic settings. That being said, I'm not affiliated to any institution. So for me, I have enormous respect for the, uh, for the methodology. But the biggest and most common question I get asked is on the veracity of memory. Um, how can you make sure what your interviewee or your participant is saying is the truth? Because not only is it based on memory, it's also based on historic memory, something that happened 70 years ago. So if I'm speaking to somebody and they say, oh, I remember my house being burnt and I remember so-and-so coming and doing this and I remember a political gathering and we went from this camp to this camp to this camp, this is what I remember. And I'm noting this down and I'm taking this as fact, because they are telling me it's their fact. And I guess it leads you to realize that there are multiple truths in the same event, because this is a human event. For me, it is the partition and the partition is a human event made of <clears throat> perspectives. Now in countries like those of the subcontinent where a rich tradition of oral culture exists and often outweighs official archive, which even scholars sometimes have to jump through hoops to get to sadly oral history becomes one of the most authentic sources to recreate and understand a certain time and it also becomes the tool to link generations to a historic event for instance when i was in school i read about the partition of india in a way that never inspired me to come home and ask my grandparents oh did you did you witness the, were you there i never asked because it wasn't taught to me in the way that seemed mine it was taught in dry language. It was taught in facts and figures. And so somehow my grandparents had become figures. So what is important is that behind each of those figures is a story. And that's oral history. It's not journalism. It's the penetration of human memory. Thank you so much, Anchal. And um, can I pass that on then to Asma? I know that we, when we were chatting, you'd mentioned something similar to what Anchal just said in terms of the, the actual in, intense reliability of oral histories and how that, yeah, that, that was something that you agreed with when we were chatting. Yeah, um, it makes me think of our work um, with the elders in Kami and Tapes. 
So yeah, we had these workshops and I would find often when we asked one elder a question and they would forget, the others would like corroborate their story for them and there'd be like this chorus of voices. So I think that's when it kind of became almost apparent that like, I felt like oral history is, like it is, it is more corroborated almost. And, 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 and also it's like a portable history and history that is handed down and passed down and embodied. And sometimes we saw, even though the elders obviously people, um, we saw them almost as like living archives with all of the knowledge that they knew. Um, but of course, like with any type of history, it's, uh, it's going to favor like the, the dominant group. And I think that's something important to be aware of regardless of whether it's oral or written. Um, yeah, and I think like in our work, because our, like because the groups that we come from are, are dominant and are the oppressive groups in, in Somalia, I think we also need to be careful uh, when it comes to like relying on that, on, on the oral history of like the dominant groups as opposed to um, the oppressed groups. And I also think, um, yeah, I think the archives, the archives themselves are like highly subjective and it's, you know, the nation that's choosing what's uh, kept in, what's left out, what's been written down. So, um, yeah, I don't know. I think, I think me personally, uh, I agree with um, Anjo. I think that oral history is incredibly reliable. Thank you so much, Asma. I love that the kind of oral history is portable history. Um, and Sadia, how, you know, I know that you also you do you do a lot of work with everyday Muslim around oral histories and and also navigating all the different all various forms of archiving. And I was really interested to hear your thoughts on this. So really echoing both of what Anshul and Asma have said, but also to to be less apologetic to say, well, yeah, it can be subjective, and yeah, sometimes the memory can be a bit off, but who cares? because you know our voices are not are not documented anywhere and if we were to critically evaluate what we call actual history or real history or the history from historians and what's written in history books if we critically evaluated them at the same level we do all history and sort of community history then yeah it's a subjective as that because they are coming from a political or a personal or a social um, viewpoint. So even if their you know, actual history or written history comes from a documented source or you know, reliable sources, they are just as subjective as you know, what we, what we um, collect from our histories. And I think what we get from a whole history as well is when it's, um, an audio recording, we get we get a voice, we get emotion, we get we get an accent, we can guess ages. There's there's a depth to every pause, every silence, um, and that's something that you can't get from written sources. So yeah, it can be subjective, but we have to remember and actually really be critical of what what we you know, what we call actual history and written history and say, well, actually, you know, it's as, a, as objective or subjective as that. Completely. So don't be apologetic. <laughs> Thank you, Sadia, for that important reminder. Um, and the next question, really, it kind of builds on this. Um, I wanted to, well, actually, no, Gazal, sorry. I wanted to ask your opinions on that question. Um, yeah. So no, I, I've got. So I'm not a historian or a, not related to any of this anyway. But I just find it absolutely fascinating because when I was looking at, uh, you know, uh, and thinking about this topic, really, it was what came to my mind was how even in uh, spiritual texts, it's really passed down through uh, oral uh, methods. And it's often chanted and it's often sung and it becomes that much more richer and doesn't still take away from its truth. Uh, so, yes, that's just something really beautiful. And I think I'm so glad that uh, it is it is being validated and we should wait for anyone else to validate it for us. We are enough and, you know, we should validate it and continue and do much more of that. 
Thank you, Gazal. And, um, and I wanted to then, you know, build in on precisely that, thinking about embodied knowledge and that, you know, for us at MFest, we really are trying to focus and place a spotlight on embodied knowledge and the vital ways that that really sustains and nourishes our communities. And so I wanted to ask you all how you see space being made for embodied knowledge when it comes to archiving and whether you see institutional spaces as being amenable to that. Um, so I thought, Antel, I would start with you again, if that's okay, to hear your thoughts on that. Thank you. Well, it's, uh, it's complicated because I'm not affiliated to any institution. Um, and yet the work that I do is taught at several institutions as an archive of a particular time, which is embodied, which is sensorial, which which engages with the body. I work with objects, historical artifacts. And so I don't know how much I can answer to whether or not the institution is amenable to such an archive. I just know that I will not stop working in a particular way, even if the institution does not recognize it as the same as written history or I don't know. I, I don't know how much that adds to the question actually. <laughs> No, that's really, that's, that's really interesting. And I think it's really interesting to consider what it brings to you to not be affiliated to institutions in that way. Um, and whether, was that a conscious choice out of interest for you? Um, well, I started my career as a metal engraver and now I write history. So I feel like it's just a it's happenstance and you need a whole bunch of institutional um, degrees to be able to teach. <laughs> it's just you know, practical reasons. But I also think that the archive I create is an alternative archive. It's, it's based on memory at a point where memory is constantly being questioned, as is your identity, as is your religion, as is your caste. And, uh, you know, so much of what the other speakers have said has resonated because the way in which history is perceived in cultures of the East or cultures that are not you know, uh, colonial cultures is so much to do with community and body and language and voice and the way things sound and how you say them and how you pass them along. And there is something sacred about that passing of text. There is like when, when the speakers are, are, when Asma is talking about her elders corroborating stories, I know what that feels like because I've seen it. The, the geography is completely different, but the sentiment is similar. You know, uh, when, uh, when I read the stories on everyday Muslim, they're about being seen, people feel seen. And I think that an archive that depends on memory and voice makes sure that the experiences are heard. So I think I've deviated quite a bit from the question actually. <laughs> no, not at all. Thank you so much, Anchal. And, I, and I'll pass that on then to Asma. Um, and I know that when we when we were chatting, you mentioned um, this story about um, when you had been working with a group of elders in an institution in Bristol. And I wondered whether that felt relevant to this question of thinking about that when embodied knowledge and institutions meet in that sense. Um, yeah. Yeah, definitely. Um, first of all, I think, I don't know, I think the way I've been defining embodied knowledge in my head is, um, it's like the knowledge that is practiced almost every day. Like we had one elder who grew up in the countryside and so knew all of the camel herding songs, knew which plants to eat and so on. Um, and yeah, so we brought a group of elders to like an institutional archive space and the archivist brought out an object and the elders said, this is a drum. And the archivist said, no, this is a food container. And then the elders hit it and it made the sound of a drum. And yet the archivist still chose to like deny their lived experience for what was written down. And I think that was a really like interesting conflict that happened of, um, yeah, I think like, you know, denying the embodied knowledge of these elders. And, and um, I think like, I think, I think it kind of, for me, because these institutions are gatekeeping knowledge and because I think their power is in, is in being the holders of this knowledge, I think for them to like, give that up is kind of also for them to become defunct like I'm not really sure how but like I, I'm not really sure how the archive could continue existing um 
yeah, without like without knowing what these objects are, um, and also even the objects themselves, because they're not being used. The elders said that they were like, it was almost like they were buried. And I thought that was really interesting um, how they're holding on to these like functionless objects and, and how they're also holding on to the idea that they're like the, the site of knowledge. Um, yeah, but I, I don't think that institutions are ready um, for like accepting that embodied knowledge is. Is, is valid. And I think I think um, the archives need to stop existing, honestly. Which is quite, it's quite out there as a point, but still, I feel like they're like relics and remnants of like colonialism. Claudia, I'm gonna let you take that off. <laughs> and I saw you shaking your head. <laughs> so oh, no, um, a bit before. <laughs> yeah, no, exactly. No, I agreed with a lot of what Asma was saying because, um, I've been in workshops and consultations with um, museums and archives across the country and had very similar experiences where it's a huge denial of, um, of the community's knowledge um, of their own history and of their own objects that are being held in these institutions. So I agree exactly with what Osmo was saying. It's completely denied again and again and again. And sometimes, and I say this a lot, but we are sort of reeled out for tick box exercises when it comes to, you know, sh organizations showing that they're, they're being diverse. But when it comes to actual decision-making, um, our voices are not heard. So I think it's, it's a difficult question to, to say, it, it's a difficult answer when we, when we look at it, it at the institu institutional space being amenable. Um, yes and no, uh, they are to a point, but when it comes to making real change, um, being really diverse, being fully representative, then no, um, it doesn't happen. And I think um, what's happened it, through digital means is that we can create our own spaces, um, like what Anshul's done with her um, Living Memory Museum online, we can do the same. We can create our own spaces, but what we've done as um, at Everyday Muslim is like, yes, we've created our own spaces, but um, we've also, because all our, all our collections are digital and it makes it amenable to, to doing this. And it's not obviously possible if you have um, physical objects, but with the digital archive, um, we've made sure that our archives are placed within um, local, um, local heritage organizations and archives in, in the places that the stories are taken from so that they're placed alongside what is, you know, traditional history or actual history or British history or whatever you want to call it. So our stories are not um, separate from that. They're part of British history and they, they're parallel and alongside and there's a lot of crossover in those stories. So for me, it's important to be part of part of those organizations and have a presence there. How well we are represented by those organizations changes. It depends on the people who have, um, have the um, higher level, you know, have their high level powers to make those decisions. So sometimes, yeah, you know, our, um, our, uh, our collections are rolled out and they're part of something bigger and something wider and something more integrated. And other times we kind of have to say, oh, you know, I've noticed that you're doing such and such um, event. Did you know that, you know, part of what we put part of our collection really is representative of what you're doing and I haven't seen it there. So they kind of, you know, just be a bit disruptive. Just say, look, yeah, we're here. Um, you can deny us as much as you want, but we still have powers. We still have a voice and we just have to take ownership of it. Thank you so much for that reminder, Sadia. And um, Kasa, can I pass that on to you? Do you have any responses in terms of everything we've been yeah, thinking about embodied knowledge? I just, uh, I mean, I, I really find a lot of what Sadia is saying so heartening uh, and encouraging. Um, and I just am reminded actually uh, by how, uh, like I was speaking to the BBC uh, last week 
uh, as an activist of London Renters Union. And it just sort of, you know, this uh, conversation that we're having brings to mind how it, it was almost like we were speaking a different language because some of the things they were asking were not really, was like very different to what my experience was. And, um, and so, yes, uh, I, I, do, I do find that uh, uh, some of these institutions can be quite uh, sort of, it, it may not always be welcoming, uh, but we have to be disruptive and make our presence felt and make spaces for ourselves and tell our stories wherever it's possible. Thank you so much, Ghazal. And I think we, Asma's in, internet has must have dropped off, but um, hopefully she'll be back shortly. We've got just over 10 minutes left. And Anshal, I really wanted to, I know we've got some photos of yours lined up. I would really love it if, if you could kind of talk through those a bit and tell us also a bit about your book and the book that you have coming up. Sure. Um, okay, uh, well, actually, I have a copy here. So uh, this is um, the first book I wrote on partition. It came out in 2019. It's called Remnants of Partition, for those of you interested. And the reason why I wrote on partition is mostly because I grew up with the knowledge, no knowledge on it. No one talked to me about it. Uh, stories were not told in my house. And uh, it seemed like a silence of practicality almost. It wasn't like the family was hiding anything. It was just like partition happened so long ago. And why do you want to bring up traumatic wounds? As I mentioned earlier, all four of my grandparents' families migrated from what is now Pakistan to India. And they settled in Delhi, where I live right now. And um, what really struck me was the enormous distance between my generation and their generation and how I would probably never see something like a partition, but that shouldn't mean that I, I shouldn't be able to understand more about it or, or try and empathize with their experience. So what I started to do was to talk to people who had lived through partition. And it was obviously very difficult because I started at the age of 22 and to talk about violence and riots and an event where 10 to 15 million people were displaced and 1 million killed is kind of something outside of your imagination. You know, you have no, except for the images that are available for you to see, you have no actual image of that time. Now, how do you get someone who has lived through something so traumatic to open up to you? Yes, you talk to your family and they may be willing to tell you stories, but more than often I was speaking to strangers. Strangers in India, strangers in Pakistan, in Bangladesh, in the diaspora, why would they talk to me? I realized that by drawing attention to something that was, we use the word equalizer in this conversation. So uh, using something that could be an equalizer between the different identities, but also an equalizer between different age groups, like an object, may get them to open up about it. And so, for instance, I would say, say somebody got this pen from Pakistan to India or India to Pakistan or Bangladesh. I would say, oh, why did you carry this pen? And how did you carry this pen? And why is it important to you? And then they would talk about who gave them the pen and where they lived and how they migrated. So through the story of the object, using the object, I restored memory, so to speak. And people became quite comfortable talking when it was through the object. Because otherwise it's very intrusive to ask someone, even though next year will be 75 years of partition, tell me what happened to you. What did you see? How did you escape? What did you lose? These are really big questions. So what I have here very quickly, I want to take you through about 10 objects, just to show you the kinds of things that people carried. Uh, great. Okay, so this is obviously, it's a British Indian passport um, that someone kept with them of that time. So people carry documents. Uh, can I see the next object? This is a matriculation certificate from the University of Calcutta. Again, people would carry documents so that maybe they would get similar jobs on the other side, or maybe it would be proof of their education. Um, they carried weapons. 
Of course, they carried weapons because they had to protect themselves. This belonged to my grandmother. She told me, it's a small foldable knife. And she told me that her mother or someone had told her to put it in their pocket every day. So all the girls got it, all the boys got it. And I think the reason why she carried it to India was simply because it was in her pocket for no other reason. Um, the next slide is a sword that was actually used to cut the umbilical cord of a pregnant woman who gave birth on the journey to India from what is now Pakistan. So this is in the Kashmir area and she was heavily pregnant. She gave birth and her husband only had this sword and he used it to cut her umbilical cord so that she could deliver. Um, the next object, I know I'm going through this really quickly, but it's just to give you a snapshot. Uh, objects of utility, of course, you know, if people lived in camps, they would get ration, like food, grains. What would they cook that ration in? These utensils belong to my great grandmother uh, and her family lived in two or three different camps. And so she carried these utensils because she knew that they would get things like, you know, wheat and flour and rice, but what would they cook them in? So these are just utensils. The next object is money. Uh, some people carried money if they had it. Uh, some people left behind all their money as well. Some people also buried their money inside the grounds and walls because people didn't trust banks at the time. So, and as a result, some people went back to uh, dig up and collect those things. And for some, those things were just lost. Similarly, the next slide, jewelry. Jewelry was very precious. So either it was an heirloom and it just couldn't be left behind or um, can you go to the next slide, please? It was used uh, for mortgage because it was a valuable item. So you could mortgage it and then you could get money to say, educate your children or, you know, buy a house or get food or whatever. Um, then there are some really unique objects like this um, trunk that uh, belonged to someone who worked in the Geological Survey of India during the, the British Raj. He gave it to his daughter, who gave it to his daughter, who's given it to her daughter, and it still exists in the house today. Or the next slide, name plates. Uh, in India, Pakistan, and Bangladesh, very old houses have name plates, uh, which are either names of the family who lives in it, or like this, it has poetry. And it's poetry written in Urdu, Farsi, and Arabic. Um, and it kind of is about the generations of the family and the construction of that house. So imagine people carried these things across as well. And the last slide, which is really what completely breaks my heart, is that they carried locks and keys because some people just weren't convinced that an event like partition, which would vivisect the Indian subcontinent, could be permanent. They just didn't believe it. They refused to believe it. So what they did was they locked their homes and they came with the assurance that we will come back, we will return. And so as a result, people all over India, Pakistan and Bangladesh have locks and keys from homes they never returned to. And it's really heartbreaking, you know, when you speak to people, and this is really where oral memory sort of supersedes anything that will ever be written about that time of partition that it is the lament and the longing and the desire to return home that is infused within this object. And it takes time. It takes time for a scholar to sit and listen. It takes time for any one story to emerge, especially if you're a stranger talking to them. But I feel like doing this not only gave them ownership of history, but gave me ownership of my past. And similarly, you know, every generation must have its own historians. So I'm a 31 year old writing about something that happened 75 years ago. And I know people of my generation care about it now because of it, because they see themselves in it and it gives them something to relate to. And I think that this is one of the ways we can ensure that history of any community is not erased by listening to their voices. Thank you so much for that, Anchal. And we are literally, we've got a couple of minutes left. Um, I just wanted to first quickly open up in case anyone, any, anyone else in the panel wants to respond to what Anchal was saying. If any of the, if there's anything, 
Otherwise, then I'm, I'm just going to move on to one final question, um, which happily um, chimes with a question sent in from the audience, um, which is what would your advice be to someone who wants to archive but isn't, um, isn't sure where to start, isn't sure where to begin? So if I start with Sadia and then we'll move around. Start. The best advice I got when I started this project was start with yourself, start with something you know. Um, start with your family, start with stories from home. Um, like Anshul said, um, objects are a really brilliant way to start a conversation. It could just be something as mundane as, I don't know, um, a cooking pot that, you know, your mom had have a cooking pot that looks bashed and looks, you know, a complete state. But you think, why do you cook in that pot? And you just, you know, start that conversation, find out why, because... There's a lot of stories in the everyday objects that are around us, um, photographs, letters, um, but yeah, start at home, start in your living room, start with, um, you know, what, whatever is on the mantelpiece that's been in the, the family for years and years and it just sits there. There's always a story behind it. Thank you so much, Sadia. I'll pass on to Gazal. So where, where, where do you begin? I would say, uh, again, like the people around you, your friends, and they have stories. And it's often, especially when it is a difficult subject, um, it can be quite uh, a tricky thing to navigate. But uh, I think it's just so important to put it down there, just so that it is heard and it is validated and it's reflected um, because there are lots of other people who may be going through similar experiences or perhaps similar past and some similar stories and they may be able to uh, see their reflection in it and, uh, and, and that is a powerful thing. Uh, so I think from ourselves and the people close to us. Thank you so much, Ghazal. And Asma, I'll pass on to you a piece of advice you would give. Yeah, I mean, I, I second everything that's been said. And I think maybe if you have like um, a specialist interest, like I don't know, 70s music in Ethiopia, there are some really great like alternative archives on online, um, on YouTube, on Twitter. Um, there are people on Facebook that are digitizing their collections, um, that are digitizing their family albums. And there's this really wonderful archiving collective called Wabiri Fern um, that you should check out. Um, and of course, I think because like Somalia and those of other countries, um, like oral history and poetry in Somalia is like a record. Um, so I think maybe continuing that tradition, learning from it. Um, and I don't think archiving has to be physical, I just think you have to be engaged in remembering. Thank you so much for that, Asma. And I'll pass it on finally to Anshal. Um, any last tips? Um, well, it's something that I follow for myself when I write. I always say that I must write for the future. Like, what would I want my future generation to know about me, just as I wish that someone in my past would have written for me. So I would say archive for the future, you know, it has whatever medium you want, but it should be something that should remain a record of your time for your future generations. Thank you so much. And thank you so much to all of you. I'm afraid we're we're just over time, um, so we'll wrap up. But thank you so much for sharing so generously. It's been such a beautiful conversation. I can't wait to watch it back. Um, and, and thank you for all the work that you do. So, you know, please do check out the work of all of the panelists. And um, thank you so much for joining us today, for, to our audiences, to our brilliant panel, and to Sumeya, who's been doing the BSL interpretation. We have two more events today um, at 5 p.m. BST in UK time. We have the book launch and um, we have a launch of Nadifa Mohammed's new book, The Fortune Men. And at 7 p.m. we have an event on telling queer and trans Muslim stories. So please do join us for those events if you can and follow us on social media to carry on the conversations. And we look forward to seeing you soon. Take care. Thank you. <laughs>